good morning, everybody. How's everyone doing this morning? Terrence, Dr. Ferrar, thank you guys for joining us. Thank you. Good to see you today. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Today we have our November Leadership Live, right? 10 at the dot. Let's get started. We have Terrence Lachey. You guys are should be familiar with him. He's basically our basically an employee here at Rosewood at this point. Um, <laughs> this is probably his third one this year. Um, the last uh, five years I've been here, he's done probably about 15 of these. So I uh, really do appreciate your insight, Terrence. Um, you're, you bring a lot of value to uh, Rosewood and all of us here, and uh, you're always been a fun uh, presenter. So uh, we're welcome November. It's a lot to be thankful for and grateful for. So we appreciate you for joining us. Thank you for having me again. And I do feel like I'm an employee, maybe a, a, a employee in residency. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Um, well, yep. Yeah. Yeah, so we always want to start with our why. And so, Terrence, you know our why is to multiply the blessing and the opportunities that have been put onto our trust. So for all you guys here um, here in Rosewood, try to memorize that. Try to remember it because, uh, you know, Scott will call you guys. And uh, a $25 gift card for Amazon can do wonders right now for this holiday season. So uh, let us know if you guys need us to send over that PowerPoint, that slide. Oh. Or just look over the uh, the YouTube videos where they should be on there. So this year, we are down to Q4. We finished up Q1, Q2, Q3. Uh, remember, the themes were our core values, and this one's going to be about spirit of excellence, leading with skills. Last week, we talked about the art delegation, de delegating with Scott, and that was a good one, especially in the holiday season. There's a lot of delegate, delegating and trying to you know, get us on schedule. And Terrence is here to talk about accountability in the workplace. So perfect timing especially here in the holidays and kind of just being accountable to the work and making sure we don't let off the gas. So Terrence, floor is yours. Great. Thank you so much, Antonio. I really appreciate the uh, intro and the review just to give everybody an opportunity to be on the same page. I did get a chance to catch Scott's presentation because um, JL sent the link. And so I was able to get a chance to take a look at that. Thank you so much. And if Scott's on the call, I can't see if he's here or not. Um, great job with setting this up. I think it's a great segue into accountability in the workplace, um, having talked about really what it means to delegate, the who, what, when, where, why, and how of that, um, he laid out pretty plainly. And so I'll be talking about accountability, and I will touch a little bit on problem solving or how accountability can be uh, helpful in solving problems. So I think I've got somebody navigating the PowerPoint for me. Is that going to be you? Antonio, or is that J-O? There we go. So we'll look at the objectives of um, our session today. We are absolutely <laughs> moving forward, not backwards. <laughs> there we go. Looking to define accountability and personal accountability. So in general, the definition of accountability as well as what it means to make that personal. Secondly, we are looking to differentiate between ownership and accountability and then focus on building accountability through leadership or accountability leadership. And we can go ahead and move to the next one. Look at this quote by um, an individual who speaks on accountability as being something that separates the wishers in life from the action takers that care enough about their future to account for their daily actions. And that's a pretty profound statement. You can advance the next slide, but thinking about those who are wishers in contrast to those who are action oriented. Accountability moves us to a place where we are not only responsible, but we start acting upon those things that we are responsible for. So a definition of accountability is here. And it is really important for us to build a team that fosters a workplace. And since accountability will be reflected in the accuracy and the efficiency of the workplace produce, of the work that is produced by the employees, we have to look at accountability as our work. Accountability is our assignment. Accountability is our duty. But accountability is also um, very much part of the virtues of an organization that is successful. So it's really the acceptance and obligation to carry out a responsibility. This includes being answerable for our decisions, our actions, as well as our outcomes. Many of you serve in various leadership roles or you have assignments that give you authority to make decisions, but in the same way, it's expected that actions are, are taken. And through delegation, of course, we can accomplish goals and objectives, but what about us? What about us as leaders? What about those who are the decision makers? How do we interlope with the 
action oriented individuals and then how do we measure outcomes is it a we them or they and i pose this question because often when we define accountability from a leadership perspective it's whoever reports to us being accountable but i oftentimes say that the leader or excuse me the organization is only as strong as those we lead and so when we are in leadership roles and we look at accountability, we have to use the plurality of it as opposed to the singularity of looking for someone else to be accountable. Our accountability to them as well as their accountability to us and our accountability to the overall organization is vital. Let's go to the next one. So when we look at personal accountability, envision your future. Think for a moment about what it looks like um, down the line for you. Um, if this job is done properly, if this project succeeds, or if this project fails. Um, so taking the responsibility of being accountable does involve us envisioning our future and taking ownership. And I'll spend some time on defining ownership or talking about that a little bit later, but being part of the vested interest of the outcome. Finding solutions, of course. When we are personally accountable, we will stop at nothing until we get to the solution of a problem or the resolve of a task that's set before us. So when we're being held accountable, it really means that you're relying on that person to produce results. And it's for that particular task. It's for that particular obligation that's been delegated. And because Scott talked about delegation, we have to think about when we delegate something to an individual, we don't just pan it off and leave it there. In fact, we do a follow-up, but we have some form of a relationship that says, we'll go back and make sure that the support is there for the job to be done and also giving people the resources to carry it out. So when we talk about being held accountable, it means that you're relying on them to produce the results, but I don't wanna let, let us off the hook as leaders or those who done the delegating. So accountability oftentimes is brought up whenever there is a conflict or whenever there is a situation that, let's say a project didn't go as it, as it, it was planned. And so you know, we'll, we'll say, who's accountable for this? And typically we start immediately blaming the individuals that we um, give the, ju the duty or the responsibility to. But really, when we look at accountability versus blame, accountable individuals gain respect from others and they also gain confidence in themselves because of the shared responsibility that goes with accountability and not necessarily the blame as to where it goes or who did it or didn't do it. Let's take a look at our next slide. I'm going to be pausing for some questions and some 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 involvement in just a moment, but I want to lay this foundation. Really, when we understand the importance, how crucial it is, think about how every individual needs to be aware of the importance of accountability within a workplace. Otherwise, they won't understand their impact or the potential that that their position has on either the success or the failure of not just the project, but the team and the organization at large and the overall objective of the organization, our why is affected when we don't understand the importance of accountability. Susan Gomez made this statement, my experience is that accountability is extremely powerful as a tool to allow, align an organization toward its objectives. And I, I, I kind of uh, stated that earlier, but I wanna reiterate the significance of when accountability is one of the highest priorities of an organization and it's a shared responsibility or a shared attribute among leadership as well as line workers, it then pushes the organization into a, a completely different category. I think um, historically we've seen organizations with top and down lines. You've got the upper echelon of leadership and then in some cases there's middle management and then you have what's called line workers or those people who execute or carry out whether it's sales or service or product manufacturing well if accountability is one of the highest virtues of an organization and used as a powerful tool it's going to be present evident and obvious in every level of the organization so modeling it is going to be one of the most vital aspects of knowing that accountability is working um, modeling punctuality, being prepared, loyalty, and then of course getting jobs done. Most people learn from their immediate supervisor or the person who they directly report to, but people are also peer oriented. Sometimes people will look to the left and look to the right of them. And if they're anything like my kids or my grandkids, they'll always compare their performance to their siblings performance. They'll say, oh, I did that because, which means that on all levels, we have to be modeling as leaders 
the, the elements of accountability. And some of them are, of course, punctuality, preparedness, loyalty, and accomplishment. And these are uh, what we would consider like the top four um, modeled activities or modeled attributes of someone who is practicing accountability. So when we value that, it's a partnership. In essence, we are not just simply um, making it something that's a rule or an expectation, but we use it as one of our core values and we integrate it. And every workplace really should include that as a core value so that when people come into the workplace, they will come knowing that accountability is a very high priority. And so let's front load some of those benefits. Front loading is really the process of setting clear expectations and guidelines at the beginning of any process. And so we can break this down to the weekly tasks or assignments, maybe quarterly performances, or maybe even the annual review. The front loading of the benefits of accountability also helps people to know one, how important it is and how it's being valued by the organization, but then also how it will impact their outcomes in the long run. So showing people ahead of time, I think it was a great speech um, orator who simply says, if you're going to inform someone, you tell them what you're going to tell them, you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them. Um, and that's an example of how when we front load the expectations of accountability, we empower people to perform with a certain level of confidence and also a certain level of calm. They're not in fear, wondering what's going to happen. They can just simply look at the guidelines, look at the expectations that have been set forward and align themselves accordingly with accountability as a tool. Let's go to the next one. So the teamwork um, element of accountability is important because it means that everybody's working together to allow more opportunities to arise. And so accountability doesn't become a penalty. It doesn't become something that is looked upon negatively, but it's something that strengthens the team. If you look at the little uh, clip art here or you look at the, the paper pyramid that's being made here with people or individuals, if you notice the base is wider than um, the very top, and that's because they're standing on each other's arms and shoulders. They're standing on the support of those who are at the foundation level and those who are in the middle, and then those, of course, who help to make up the very top of an organization or the top of a team. So thinking about how working together is an absolute must, accountability then becomes a shared value as opposed to just a value that someone imposes upon someone else. Let's go to the next one. And so there's a cycle associated with it. And I oftentimes take a look at the cycle as being something that we can look at daily or we can look at it on a weekly basis or a quarterly basis um, or every encounter. Establish the goals. When I'm giving instructions to somebody who works with me, um, I, I simply want to make sure that I'm clear in what the outcomes or what the expectations are. But then also delegating, which we talked about or which Scott talked about last presentation, it creates ownership, meaning I'll give the responsibility or I'll give certain tasks or ask the individual, which of these tasks do you feel most comfortable in working with? Now, of course, if it's a directive, then I have to give it as a directive. But if it's a team effort, then we can talk about strengths and areas where somebody may be more proficient than someone else. Another element of importance in this cycle is monitoring or measuring. Now, monitoring and measuring is not exactly the same as evaluation and feedback, which comes last, but monitoring and measuring throughout the process is important in accountability because if we wait until the end performance or we wait until the final project is done, um, taking into consideration glitches or setbacks or delays or deadline moves, um, if we're not measuring the, the accountability cycle or through the accountability cycle, we may not get the outcome that we expected, which means that the evaluation and the feedback Feedback will be negative, which does not reinforce the accountability cycle. So the accountability cycle can be reinforced if that element, that third element, monitoring and measuring, is practiced all throughout the process. Let's go to the next slide. Right here, I'd like to take a few minutes to pause for some questions or some thoughts and ideas as it relates to your understanding of accountability. Cindy Tucky made this statement, accountability is a key concept in moving an organization forward, especially in challenging business climate, in a challenging business climate. I would say that we were probably facing the fallout or um, the turnaround of one of the most challenging business times or eras that we've lived in um, because of the effects of the 
most recent pandemics and the economy and wars and all sorts of things that affect the economy in some type of way, the business climate then is indirectly affected by it. So let me pause for a moment and see if there are thoughts or questions or maybe even some insights as it relates to accountability. You know, after a while, when I don't get any comments, I start looking at the bright faces and the people who are smiling. Yep, that's you, Sherry. Go for it. <laughs> I think I picked you. The I'm going to have to learn how to frown. I don't know how to do it, but I'll figure exactly. it out one of these days. Well, this, no, one, this, actually, is what you get, this is what you get when you look so intentive. You're in there. You're like, <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm listening to you and taking it in. I do Thanks. like um, a lot of what you're saying. I think it's hard sometimes for people to be accountable for their actions because they don't want the spotlight to be on them. But I also think that when they realize that taking accountability and being able to own that and being responsible for your own actions actually gives them more. Even if you fail, it gives you more. I don't know. It's like people still are like, you know what, they're willing to be honest with me and they're bought into that. So even if you succeed or you fail, people are still there with you to support you and help you versus if you hide behind saying something else. If you're just true and can put out there what it is, then I think people are willing to embrace that and either work with you to help you get where you need to go or, you know what I mean, know that they can count on you even if it's, you know, something harder to do. And I think that, you know, even your little, um, people standing on top of people. I kind of like that because I think at my level, I'm probably at the lower to the middle end of that, but I still appreciate my, my part of that because it's still any part of that. If you let go or you don't do what you're supposed to do, the entire thing falls apart. And I think people need to realize and appreciate where they are in that. You don't have to be at the top to still be an important part of the pyramid. So, and I think that, you know, if you're willing to accept your responsibility of what that pyramid is and how important your part really is, because just showing up is an important part and doing what you're asked to do is an important part, whether it's small or big or whatever it is, just knowing that when they ask it of you and that the people that are asking you, can count on you to do it is important so whatever yeah. is asked of you you know just be real and if it's something that's outside of your expectation that you can't do then be real about that too you yeah. know and give a good yeah. reason for it so yeah you bring up a good point in looking at that illustration of the pyramid um i agree 100 percent. every one of those individuals are, is vital because if you remove any of them it's going to cause the pyramid to either be weakened or maybe even collapse and so when we think about standing on the shoulders of others, whether it's through tradition and, and maybe the heritage of an organization, um, we also have to look at the everyday teamwork. Uh, Dr. Fubara mentioned something, and, and, and uh, it's worth mentioning in, in the chat. He talks about how um, holding people accountable is a tool um, for blame or making someone a scapegoat. Yeah, I, I think negatively, when we hold a person accountable in, in the previous tense or where we um, looked at it in, in the past, it was something that something went wrong and we had to blame it. We had to put the blame somewhere. We had to troubleshoot it and find out who was responsible for this. Whereas on the onset, a proactive perspective is that we're all responsible going in. So let's be clear of the expectations. Let's be clear of the assignments, the duties, the roles, so we can share in the, in the outcome. Hopefully it's victorious, but if it's not, we also share in the accountability of what didn't happen. You know, I think that's an important piece too, because the transparency of someone saying we failed as opposed to you failed, um, and we can fix this, or we can work together to do better next time, or how can we improve our performance? That's a whole different vocabulary than somebody who's just simply, I'm holding you accountable. You know, it's it's a top down type thing. Um, Nicole says something that I think is vital. Your accountability cycle diagram is helpful. I agree with this statement about how the pyramid's strength comes from strong foundations at the base. I agree 100%. Um, you probably would not put someone brand new at the base of the accountability pyramid. You probably want to get um, some some very strong, um, proven soldiers, veterans to be able to hold up the hierarchy, which means that the newest and probably the most novice may be at the top. And when I say at the top, I don't mean in the hierarchy of authority, but I mean in the forefront. You mentioned the background, Sherry. There are people who don't want to be in the limelight or in the front, in the center. When you think about it as an organization, we're all on front. We're all, you know, even, even me representing Campbell University for this group is in front of, you know, a, a population of people. So I would have to be accountable for what's expected of me as well. 
So you think about no matter whether it's a vendor, whether it's a, a supplier, whether it's an internal customer, an external customer, whether it's a division or maybe one of the other uh, groups within the family of, of organizations, we still have to be accountable to one another. So that's vital. Great. Thank you guys for sharing those. Let's uh, take a look at the next slide now that we've got quite a ways to go. There are five C's of accountability that I wanted to share, and these require clarification, common purpose, communication, collaboration, and consequences. Now, you think about clarification, we mentioned that in saying that there should be a very clear um, uh, set of expectations that is communicated at the very beginning. So we can kind of scratch two of them off the list if we just simply go with the cycle of accountability. But when we look at the five C's, it's easy to remember. You got five fingers. You can always just kind of attribute one of those fingers to clarification. That's a very principal thing. And then the common purpose would be um, pointing toward, use your pointer finger, pointing toward the common goal, the purpose that we all share. And then the communication is something that I think it's vital for us to think about because our assumption is that everybody understands everything that we say, when people hardly understand everything that we say most of the time. And I know that almost seems like a quagmire, but think for a moment about how easy it is to misconstrue um, uh, uh, an email or maybe a text or maybe even a statement that somebody says via the internet over a, 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 a meeting like this, or maybe in person while we're passing through the hallway. Or maybe we have to wait until the next quarterly meeting to bring out our communications. Well, think for a moment about how collaboration works. If collaboration is at work, there are those who communicate effectively that can help those of us who don't communicate better. And then, of course, the other C of that accountability, um, those five C's would be the consequences, which we know as the outcomes, the bottom line. What happens as a result of us being accountable? Well, increased productivity, probably goals being met. Um, in most cases, it's a matter of the team advancing or moving further or closer to its goals. But then the negative consequences of accountability are associated with the lack thereof, the lack thereof, not necessarily I'm holding you accountable. No, it's we're accountable. Everyone's not holding their, their carrying their weight and the collaboration is broken. So therefore, our consequences are now skewed or our consequences are less than what expected, what's expected. So we look at it up and down a spectrum. If those five things are um, necessary in order for accountability to operate, we really cannot afford to miss any of them. We have to assess the consequences. Most people start with the consequences because if it's a negative situation, they go, who was responsible? Let's, let's advance the next slide. So if we look at each one of these individually, and I'll skim through them since I've already introduced them, um, making sure that we have clarification can help to re reduce stress. I honestly believe that most people are more afraid of the unknown than they are the known factors. If I know I've got 12,000 of these pieces of product due, then I, I'm a lot more acceptant of the challenge than I don't know how many I've got and how many I've got to do. It causes fear. The unknown is probably the biggest element that drives fear, and it can be clouded in the clarification process. Clarification also builds trust. If you let me know and I let you know and we let each other know, then the clarification is in play and we now can trust one another because we're open and we're honest about what's expected. Let's go to the next one. So that common purpose would be the most effective team's um, goal. Let's get to the common per purpose. It really explains what and why we're doing what we do. I like how with every one of these sessions, you start with the why of the organization. And I think that the why of the organization reminds us of the common purpose, and it causes the team to always know I'm here for a reason. This is not by happenstance. I'm not just here to waste time or I'm not here because I got to check this off my list. But the common purpose, of course, is really, really clear to multiply the blessings and opportunities. And so we do that collectively. It's not a singular effort, but it's a common purpose. Let's look at the next one. Communication, which I nailed that one uh, constantly. I kind of beat the nail on that one because I majored in communication 
at Michigan State way back in the day, and the definitions never really change. Um, there are different models of communication, but the full understanding of communication is that it's an ongoing process. And it's clear that we know what the expectations or the outcomes are, and we have to be concise in communicating in order to understand each other, but then also offering feedback helps. So it's a sender of a message, a receiver, receiving that message, processing it, and then giving some feedback. There are elements of noise or disturbance that conflict oftentimes, and they could be delays, they could be interruptions, they could be things within or without our control. But if we keep the line of communication open, we can work through those things as well. And they're not distractions. Sometimes we can even build in and anticipate them. Let's go to the next one. So collaboration, look at those pieces of puzzle being put together. It's really taken an individual effort though to produce a significant team accomplishment. And that's a different approach to the term collaboration. Most of the time we look at collaboration as being, oh, we're just in this together. And I talked about shared values as well as the shared common objectives, but collaboration first starts with an individual assessment. And it starts with me making a concerted effort to bring my piece to the puzzle. If I don't bring my piece, when I do this workshop in person, there's an exercise we do um, where we break up into teams and there are puzzles that have to be put together and um, each team is, and I'm kind of giving it away because because we're not in person, each team is missing a piece to the puzzle. And they will find shortly that the piece has been given to another team. And when the team finds out that they have a piece that doesn't fit or doesn't match or they're missing a piece, but they have an extra piece, they eventually begin to recognize how important it is for each other to bring those pieces together. And then ultimately, if it's three teams, all three of those individual puzzles make a larger puzzle. So just kind of envision that in your mind. There's a statement in the in the chat here. Um, oh, you know, these are just thumbs up and smiley faces. Let's go to the next slide. Consequences, and that's the, the last part. And I did talk a little bit about how frequently their thought is just being negative. Consequences can also include the celebration of the success. Consequently, we were able to celebrate because we exceeded our goals. Now, if that's not a positive statement, I don't know what is. Consequently, when we hear the term consequences, often there's a negative um, connotation. If you agree with that, drop it in the chat there. If you, if you relate to consequences or thought about consequences negatively in the past, um, just be honest and say, yeah, that's what comes to mind. I don't do it intentionally, but whenever I hear people say consequences, I have to reroute that. I got, I've got to intentionally rethink it and say, okay, there are some positive options for consequences as well as some negative ones. Let's go to the next slide. Thanks. So Pat Summit made this statement, responsibility equals accountability equals ownership. That's an equation. Accountability equals, excuse me, responsibility equals accountability equals ownership. And a sense of ownership is the most powerful weapon that a team or an organization can have. I know earlier one of the quotes was from somebody who said that accountability is one of the most powerful tools. And both of them are. You really can't have one without the other. When someone identifies as being accountable, their responsibility is obvious. When someone is responsible, their accountability is expressed. And then ownership is what we're getting into now. Nowadays, whether it's a um, stock option, whether it's a family-owned company, whether it's employee um, where employees uh, are, are part owners, there's a level of ownership that simply says when the organization does well, I do well. And when I do well, the organization does well. And it becomes now um, ownership of responsible accountability. Let's go to the next one. Sherry says, I would change it for my kids to actions and reactions. That makes sense. Because when you say consequences, oftentimes that puts fear, you know, in a person. Um, probably because the suffix of the word consequences is con. I don't know. But yeah, you're right. Um, repercussions is probably another word that I heard a lot coming up as a kid. You know, if you don't do what I told you, there will be repercussions. <laughs> so building ownership and stewardship are almost synonymous. Think for a moment about how ownership and accountability allows a person to feel vested in the success of a team. But it also gains a sense of autonomy because me owning my part, piece of the puzzle, and being responsible for that gives me a sense of pride because I'm going to bring the best piece to the, to the puzzle, to the larger, to the larger group. 
But that ownership has to be something that I've done a personal assessment of. If someone is at a job just to perform the tasks and to get the, the earnings, then they're shorting themselves, but they're also shorting the company or the organization. The expectation of being vested is not unreasonable considering that we spend 40, 50, sometimes 60 hours a week with people that are not blood related to us and, and we call them coworkers or our work family. Ownership in that family is as important as the family that we're biologically associated with because of the amount of time that we spend and also the livelihood. Think about the living that we earn with the people that we work with. And sometimes we spend more time with the individuals that we work with than we do the people that we know and love at home um, because of our cycles and our patterns and if there's travel involved. Um, it really gives us a sense of autonomy and also it develops growth. When people have ownership and stewardship as synonyms, they realize that it's our work that we are advancing the, the mission of the organization, it really then grows an individual and they become ripe for promotion. They also become even more prepared for opportunities and challenges that the organization may face because now it's we're looking out for potential pitfalls as opposed to someone else watching my back. Let's go to the next slide. So let's look at a contrast of ownership and, and, and accountability. Accountability is connected to an extrinsic motivation, whereas ownership is connected to intrinsic motivations. Now, the reason why I wanted to show the contrast is because we have both. We have both intrinsic motivations as well as extrinsic motivations, and everybody's different. When we look at personality types, when we look at enneagrams or behavioral styles or our strengths, any of those tools that assess characteristics or traits and attributes that we exhibit at work, they're going to be varied. There's going to be multiple ones, which means that everyone in the organization won't share the very same extrinsic, extrinsic motivations. Some people um, are extrinsically motivated by, you know, just the thought of the concept of our company being on top, whereas another person may be extrinsically motivated by, am I going to receive the profit share or the reward of my efforts? Intrinsically motivated individuals are driven by um, oftentimes a, a different beat of, of, of the drum. I often say it's the heartbeat of the individual and their passion for what they do. I have this poster downstairs that simply says, do what you love and love what you do. And when you think about that, people who carry that value are often more peaceful, they are more positive, and then they're also more engaged to solve the problem as opposed to lament the problem. Um, Jason put in the comment, it seems most consequences are usually relational. Authority figures are mad or happy with you. And the felt effect of someone mad at you is way more powerful than someone is when someone is happy. It requires effort and intentionality to provide tangible consequences. I agree. I agree. Attitude is everything. I do a session called Attitude is Everything, and, and it's um, centered around uh, a video that was made of an organization. This was long before the pandemic that was um, infested with an attitude virus. And I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's a it's a it's a common video that's been used called "Attitude Is Everything," and in the workplace, there are viruses that go around, both the natural ones as well as the ones that we cannot see. And those are oftentimes negativity, or oftentimes words, ideals, ideologies that people have, and the negative ones spread a lot faster and a lot further than the positive ones. So we have to be conscientious about that. And in order to inoculate against that type of virus, we have to be healthy. And I think accountability is one of those elements or those attributes for a healthy organization. Let's go to the next one. So the ownership mentality in, in, in general is seeing the bigger picture. It's also believing in oneself, not just my boss must believe in me, so I must be okay. How about I believe in me and I can do it, I can show it through my actions and I'm looking at the bigger picture. It may even be someone who is on a quest for career advancement. In that quest for career advancement, they simply add more value to the current work that they're doing. And then they show the potential of their ownership or their being vested in the organization by taking on other tasks. So ownership mentality really, really broadens a perspective as opposed to just simply owning my, my uh, silo. 
um, I work for a university or a college, and in that college, we are, we've been debating now for the last 20 years about silos and how to destroy them and how we don't need to operate in silos, and silos are a bad thing. Well, silos are a bad thing, but to the person who is the silo king or queen, it stores all their grain. And unfortunately, when people hoard or store their grain in a silo, when we are a vast organization, there is um, limitation for the potential of that organization because of the silo. So promoting an ownership mentality helps us to eliminate silo behavior. All right. I actually think and experience in many ways long-term success is driven by far better by positive reinforcement. Consequences are still important and need to be raised when appropriate. Exactly. Connecting silos is the heart of networking. I like that, Timothy. Um, when you go by here in Michigan, we have a lot of farms. And if I'm driving from, let's say, Grand Rapids to Lansing, I can see a farm with silos side by side. The silos aren't scattered. The silos actually, if you look very close, are oftentimes interconnected. And when one silo is full, the, the granary process causes the next silo to receive and then the next silo and so forth and so on. So if we can connect them, then that's fine. The silos may just be the attributes of distinguishing, maybe time frame, first in, first out. Um, you know, element when it comes to grain or farm. I'm not a farmer, but I would imagine first grain in is the first grain out. And so the, the necessity of silos is important to acknowledge. But when we're talking about organizations, no individual is an island. I often use uh, and quote the ancient text that we don't live into ourselves. We don't tie into ourselves. Um, no person's an island. We are interconnected in some kind of way. Let's go to the next one. So why does it matter? We started with why, we'll start kind of narrowing this in. Employees who take ownership will help the company to advance because they're creating something and they're creating a trust between coworkers. Now the word trust it is a verb or a noun, but, but trust is, is that bond, the glue, that literally keeps an organization together in the tumultuous times, in the rough times and also the opportunities, uh, opportunistic times. Think about the times of opportunity when we're trying to um, roll out a new product or advance through diversification, maybe even be disruptive. What if we're the disruptors? And that's a good thing, not a negative thing, if we're disruptors in a, in a field. Well, during the time of advancement, trust is most important because it creates a healthy environment against the storms, the external storms, but it also eliminates internal conflict and internal storms because I can trust that the decision that you made was in the best interest of us all, or I can trust that you believe enough in me that when I perform at my best, I'm going to give you what I have, my very best. And so as you can see, it can be as interpersonal or intrapersonal as you would like, but it's important for ownership and trust to be part of this virtue that we call accountability. Let's go to the next one. So when we weigh um, the opposite of that, think about micromanaging as opposed to simply affording trust or giving people responsibility. Micromanaging really damages that trust and it causes insecurity, stress. People actually have um, commented over over the years of my experience with teams and team building how they have a physiological response to someone lording over them or to someone giving them the the the, the sense of stress because their presence denotes the expectation that is either insurmountable or wasn't clearly communicated and so micromanaging is really not the answer because we work with adults and there are four, maybe five, in some cases, six generations working in a workplace, we have to consider what is identified as micromanaging. One generational group may say, give it to me, give me the deadline, give me the clear expectations, and I'll get it back to you before the deadline. Another demographic group may say, no, I want you to touch base with me along the way, and I want to show you what I'm doing because I need your feedback in order to feel affirmed. Another generation may say, well, the expectation is that I get it done, right? So you don't have to watch me. You don't have to tell me, you know, what to do. You've already told me. Now let me figure it out. I mean, so there are different dynamics when it comes to identifying what's considered micromanaging. 
And so we have to be conscientious of that. We have to be careful to know that what is micromanaging to me may or may not be micromanaging to someone else. In I'm a baby boomer, but I'm right on the cusp of being of another generation. And so that generation after me um, is probably used to the micromanaging of people from my generation. But the third generation in is probably not as palatable to micromanaging, and they resist in passive ways. And that's another workshop, but we will find that sometimes generational differences um, can redefine a word, can redefine a word. People will say, I feel like you're micromanaging me. And I'm going, I'm not micromanaging you. I'm giving you deadlines and I expect you to perform. And so by me asking before the deadline, I'm now giving you a warning that these are what the expectations are. Notice how I use the words deadline and warning. Well, those are micromanaging terms to somebody's ears, whereas I think they're absolutely necessary terms to high performance. And so we have to be conscientious of it, choose our vocabulary wisely. Um, Scott gave the quadrant um, of what is considered important and not important or urgent versus um, less urgent. And I think that that model is probably effective in giving each team or each generational group an opportunity to look at that and go, okay, let me adjust because it's obvious that the rest of my team has these as most urgent matters. I think that's vital. One of the things, Scott, that I picked up is how you mentioned um, CCs. When you get a CC on, a, on an email, it, it immediately goes into the I'll read it later or maybe not file. I'm going to pick that up and practice it because I waste a lot of time reading things that were just FYI. And, um, you know, I, I guess I should probably pick a time a day just to read the FYIs. Um, because it interrupts the flow or the train of thought, because now I start participating in whatever the communication is between the two individuals that I got CC'd on. And so I'm not required to, to participate in that. Um, and like you said, if it were important, I'd be the first line as opposed to CC. Now, someone else has um, uh, opposite thought to that, saying, I want to know everything micromanagers probably. Um, so copy me on it, blind copy me on it. Um, so blind copy, hmm. I guess that could work, um, but I guess I, I will need to take the time to decide whether it's a CC or a BC. And that's important. So John made a statement. I think it's also, this also applies to how much collaboration is needed to truly get a mutual understanding of clear objectives. I agree, collaboration is bringing our best game putting it on the table and allowing ourselves to be vulnerable. So I do believe that collaboration is one of the, those five C's. If we spend time, more time in collaboration, we'll, have to, we'll need to spend less time in trying to clarify. So we can overlap those. We can bring collaboration and clarification together. Thanks, John. Nicole says he brought up a great point. And adding to that, collaboration levels are also or also are dependent on the stages of the project. That is true. At the beginning, if collaboration consists of clarification, somewhere in the middle, collaboration could be on assessing the progress. And toward the end, collaboration could be on celebrating the success or tweaking just before we pull the trigger on a new project or something. So yeah, thanks, Nicole. Let's go to the next one. So sharing the vision, and that's something that we can do during collaboration, of course, or clarification. Sharing the company's vision, though, is a powerful motivator, and it helps to guide the employees towards success. Uh, it creates that common ground, which we talked about having a common ground, um, where employees can focus their time and their efforts. I love the fact that um, this organization is very clear with its goals, its driving um, perspectives, a philosophy, so you can call them whatever you like. I think that they are very clear that the organization looks to um, center all activity around the why, and that why continues to drive those values. Those value statements are plastered everywhere, and I think that those are the important pieces that subliminally kind of creep into the, the, the mindset or the psyche of our functioning every single day. Um, I've got a, a motivation wall here in my home office, and it's got framed work um, with definitions of words like leadership, tenacity, resilience, execution, perseverance, persistence, grit, determination, and then ultimately success. Well, keeping those values in front of me, those are personally my values um, for, for me, Inc., um, those help me to stay on target. They help me to stay on track. And they serve 
well inside of organizations. Let's go to the next one. And so John Quincy Adams said this, if your actions aspire, inspire others to dream more, learn more and do more and become more, then you're a leader. Now that's an interesting statement because it's deductive. Um, you know, when you think about the fact that our actions as leaders require something in the middle. Yeah, I'm a leader. Well, you're a leader because you did what? Or you're doing what? Well, am I inspiring others to dream? Am I inspiring others to learn? Am I inspiring others to become more? Now, John Quincy Adams, of course, is a great part of, of, of our history. And if this is something that was grasped and carried on, I think we'd be a lot further along. So this is relevant for today. It might be an idiom from then, but it actually applies now. That as leaders, and John Maxwell will probably agree, that leadership is influence. Nothing more, nothing less. John Maxwell made that statement, and I think it coincides with what John Quincy Adams said about inspiring others to dream and to learn and to become more in order for them to be empowered, but also the organization. All right, next slide. So as it relates to leadership and accountability, it really involves using those authoritative skills and modeling the behaviors for the team. Accountability leaders or accountable leaders, they use their integrity and their discipline to set those standards. And I, I started with the accountability through role modeling. And when we model the behavior that we'd like to see and we do it naturally and we do it without pretense, what happens is that people begin to admire our character. And our character could just be the sum total of those attributes that we show when we're doing the work for the organization or when we're making the team successful. That's really what true leaders are. They aren't necessarily the people who sit you down and tell you what they expect, but they're people who show you how it's done and they show you through their behaviors and their actions. I think about some really outstanding leaders that I've served under in my life. I picked up their attributes. <clears throat> and something that each of them has done has influenced me in some type of way to where now I'm modeling the behavior, <clears throat> excuse me, that was modeled for me. And because I can model their behavior, I'm perpetuating the success that they gave birth to inside of me. Nicole, I think John brought up a great point I'd like to add to. Oh, it's just a heart that goes with it. All right, let's go to the next one. So if we define leadership, we define it as integrity, loyalty, enthusiasm, and competency. Of course, there's probably a lot more attributes that go along with leadership. But if we just for the purposes of looking at accountability and leadership, it's the integrity of the individual, their loyalty and enthusiasm, and then also their ability to perform, hence supporting the whole modeling thing. So even though a person could operate in integrity, if they don't have the competency to model the behavior, it's unreasonable for them to have the expectation that somebody else would. So we should be products of the product. We should be um, doers first um, and then inspire others to be doers as well and not just hearers. And so when integrity, loyalty, enthusiasm, and competency are working together, it epitomizes that influence that leadership has. Let's go next to the next one. So back to the puzzle. The role of the organization really is to practice that leadership, but to be positive and then to be the team player. Now notice that's not just the leader's responsibility, but that's everybody within the organization and everybody bringing a piece to the puzzle, everybody wanting to take their piece and make sure that it fits somewhere else. And when you find that it doesn't fit, you don't just jam it. You, you, don't, you can't even take it out and go back and retool it. You just simply have to work patiently and intricately through some type of strategy. I don't know if you've ever put together a puzzle with your family or with friends or in an exercise, you know, like, like the one I mentioned earlier, um, but you really need all hands on deck. You really need everybody. If somebody's holding their piece, then it's not going to let the puzzle, it's not going to bring the puzzle together. Or if someone um, is, is just dead set on being the center of the puzzle when actually they have an end piece, end piece is going to be important for us to share the, the, the center. Um, if you look at those pieces, some of those pieces are edge pieces. They're end pieces and not pieces that are sorted. That's just for the inside. If you notice the inside pieces all have a connector, whereas the outer pieces have a flat line. Um, transpose that to people within the team. Transpose that to what they bring to the table. Some things are foundational, and then other things are what makes up the middle. 
All right, let's go to the next. So the manager in this situation um, really needs to possess those leadership skills and also implement strategies that are aligned with the employees and including everyone in the mission. Notice it says aligned with the employees, strategies that are aligned with the employees. Oftentimes we look for everything to align with the vision of the organization and it should, but the manager's job is to kind of serve in the middle to bring the pieces together the manager's job in most organizations. So you may have executive leadership and then you may have managers and then you have line workers. And in that case, the manager's responsible for making sure that the middle gets in the middle and the ends get on the end. And they serve as a link or bridge between the organization's goals and objectives and the employee's goals and objectives. That's why it's called managing. Um, the next slide. So the employee then accepts the position, they are expected to arrive to work each day on time and have a respectful attitude. But there is so much more that is expected. Of course, this is the primary expectation. Have a good attitude, be here on time, but we also expect them to do the work. We expect them to not only do the work, but perfect the process, find out ways to do it better, more efficiently, more effectively. I often tell people that report to me, work yourself out of a job. When you become the only person that can do a thing, you become mysteriously vulnerable for replacement. Um, that means that we have to share the load, share the responsibilities, share the processes. It used to be job security for a person to be the only one who could do this. Well, now it's a liability for an organization. So employees have a responsibility of making sure across the board that we share the responsibilities, but we are also um, integrated, cross-trained, if you will, in being able to cover for one another as employees on that team. And then of course, helping the manager, help the organization to help us all fit and work together like that puzzle. Let's go to the next one. So we strengthen our leadership ability by closing the gap. And those skills really are individual skills that we lend to one another, like the individual at the top of the mountain reaching to give the other person a hand. Now, wouldn't it be an inverted perspective to think that the person who's climbing up the mountain is reaching to pull down the person who's at the top of the mountain? Well, that, that, that's a, a, a sidewinded way of looking at it. But in some cases, people are hesitant to reach back and give the hand to the person who's climbing up for fear of them pulling us down. When in actuality, a, a true leader or someone with leadership ability is proficient enough to stand their ground and also help someone else up by bridging the gap between that distance. And it's helping put people in the proper place. And it's sharing the limelight. It's sharing the, the, the glory of we accomplished this together. Let's go to the next slide. Thomas Matt made a statement, in reality, we all have our lives and the accountability for the achievement of our dreams and goals fall strictly on your, our own shoulders. Well, I don't necessarily agree with this, but I put it here so that we can look at how there is a perspective that just simply says that the achievement of our dreams and our goals are up to us. Well, if that were true, we probably wouldn't be on this call. Since we are inner related in some way, whether temporarily or on long-term basis, it really does rely on, on each other. You help me, I help you, we help each other. And those are the kinds of things that we have to start considering when we talk about accountability, because if I'm only accountable for me and me alone and my dreams and my goals, then my shoulders are probably gonna collapse at some point because someone else is gonna stand on it and there's no room and then we find that there's a negative outcome. So I just thought I'd bring another perspective to the table. And the next one, setting those goals. Of course, it's our responsibility when they're personal, but when they're shared goals, it's important for us to make sure that the goals are communicated properly and that they help to provide a sense of motivation and direction for the organization's outcomes or the project's outcomes. So goal setting should be a shared responsibility. And it's not something that someone else sets the goal and then I perform it. Let's go to the next one. Looking at our time here. So SMART goals, this is something you've probably heard before. It's been used by quite a few of the speakers and, and leadership developers that SMART goals are specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. And when we set those goals as such, 
um, it makes it a lot simpler. And if this is adopted as being the model of goal setting among teams and across the organization, then everybody will probably end up at the same spot of success by looking at the goal specifically, measurably, something that can be achieved that is realistic and also with a timestamp. Let's go to the next one. So when we ask the question about who is the accountable individual, in order to make the target, in order to, to get the bullseye, we have to look at it on all three levels. If we start with ourselves, it's the individual goal and objective, then we look at the team that we're a part of, and then the overall business or organizational goals. We're all accountable. I'm accountable for my individual goals, but my individual goals are part of the team's goal. And then the team's goal feeds into the overall organization or the business's goal. So they're interrelated in some kind of way, just as those circles on the bullseye all make up targets. There's the one through 10 level. In order to get to a 10, I think that the accountability has to be shared. Timothy said, good management is, but teaching and coaching in loving in a loving way to help encourage and inspire relevant ideas that affects the outcome that the team seeks to attain. I agree 100%. So when we think about management, serving as teachers and coaches and motivators to get the job done. It's something in loving. I like that. It, it's something that we have to intentionally do, you know, do that by accident. And so in order for the bullseye to be met, of course, there needs to be some velocity behind that dart. And that dart may be thrown by an individual, but it's reflective of our team effort as well as our overall objective as an organization. All right. I think we're coming to the close. A few other slides. <clears throat> Excuse me. So identifying your why. We started with the company's why. Identifying your why. Simon Sinek is known for that. Always remember that your position plays an important part for the overall organization, but understand why you are beneficial to your team. Your why could be your personal objective, but it's what drives you. It's what gets you there every day. John Doyle says, my dad's teaching was boiled down to the world doesn't owe you or not entitled to anything. Go and earn it. I like that. And of course, the why is the target. That makes a lot of sense. So the target for each of us individually is our individual why. But within that target, we should be able to find the why of the organization. I love the why statement for this group because it's something that you can use in your personal life as well. When you look at that, multiplying the blessings and opportunities that you have um, that, that has been in place, place within your, your trust is something that you can take home with you. That's not something that's just in the company, but it's something that is part of your own personal value as well. Let's go to the next one. So satisfaction, that's the outcome. Of course, workplace satisfaction for each of us, every one of us, is going to be contingent upon what our expectations are. So employees will have internal satisfaction knowing that all of their hard work is paid off. My expectation is that what I do matters um, what I contribute is valued and who I am is important. That's where workplace satisfaction takes place. And the accountability factor is a shared common goal then. And people don't mind giving all of themselves when they feel appreciated. Let's go to the next one. So here are some closing words of wisdom. I'll give you an opportunity to look at them in our final exercise would be for you to read these four and, and put in the chat, or you can say it aloud, which of these do you resonate with, excuse me, the most? Sam Silverstein, Will Craig, Fire Impulsifer, or Tom Hansen? So feel free to take yourself off of mute once you've read all of them. And you can share or you can drop it in the chat. With that being said, I'm going to turn it back over to either Dr. Fubara or Antonio. Scott, I don't know if you were on the line earlier when I mentioned that I watched your presentation from the last, the, your last presentation. Good stuff. Thank you, Terrence. Appreciate it. I see Will Craig's winning here so far, right? <laughs> Great. All right, you guys, feel free to drop them in the chat and um, I'm done. Thank you all so much for 
for uh, allowing me to present again. Sorry for the nasal the, the nasal congestion going on here. The Sudafed hasn't kicked in yet, so <laughs> I'll be better by my next presentation. Dr. Fabar, did you have anything you wanted to, to say? Uh, I'll just say thank you. Um, uh, Terrence, of course, has been a regular, as uh, Antonio mentioned, at Leadership Live and uh, continues to um, provide uh, quality and um, value. So thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Great. Antonio, it's on you. Well, thank you guys for joining our Leadership Live for November. You can find this tomorrow. We'll send an uh, email to kind of... Uh, rehashing and summarizing what we learned today and uh, sending it to everybody else who missed the call for the field employees as well. So please share it. Please let your coworkers, if, if they missed it, we're one more down to finish up Q4. Um, thank you, everybody. Everybody, I hope you guys enjoy your Thanksgiving. If I don't see you, so happy Thanksgiving. And thank you, uh, Terrence and Dr. Barbara, for putting this together and getting us uh, a good leadership live. So thank you, guys. Great. Thank you. Looks like Hanson has it. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah.